If you have your Bibles, tablets, pads, your scripture of choice. We are in Hebrews chapter 2. We're going to try to finish this series on Jesus in Hebrews today. Father, as we get into your word right now, we just thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for more revelation and understanding of your heart and the things of your kingdom, Lord. Would you let your word speak to each one of us exactly at the point we need to hear it from you? Let your voice be heard. Let your spirit be felt. And just bring to light what you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go ahead and read from verse 10 to 18. Of what chapter? Hebrews chapter 2. For it was fitting for him from whom all things and through whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Saying, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children whom God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. And through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be like his brethren in all things that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. That's a lot. Oh, and we'll unfold some of that. It, it's a lot to take in, but we're going to try to bring it to a place of understanding and simplification. So last week, we talked about what it means that everything was made through him and for him and what that meant to us. And you can go back and listen to it. It's only, I say 12 minutes. Jim says it's 18 minutes, but you know, we'll see. Look at the video. Um, but it... So today I want to look at the second part, beginning the second part of verse 10, where he says, in bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation. Who is the author of our salvation? Jesus. Jesus. Isn't he perfect? Yes. Fully God, fully man. He's supposed to be perfect. So why does he need to be perfected? What is missing that's not making him perfect? Well, it doesn't have to do with him specifically, but it has to do with us and his purpose. He was perfected through suffering. His suffering made him, or I should say, made what he did perfect. Remember, 
Why would Jesus come to earth? Why would God leave the stone to come to earth? Because his children needed help. Imagine you seeing somebody who needs help, who's in distress, and you try to help them. And if you helping them didn't work, were your efforts fulfilled? Were your intent fulfilled? Jesus came because he knew his children needed help. He is perfected by the work that he did so that his children can be helped. Right? There's something too. When I accept Jesus in my heart as the one who saved me, as the one who's healed me of the wounds of my past and washed away the sins of my past, of the one who's empowered me to live a victorious life, like I'm not waiting to die to get to heaven, I can actually live a good life with Jesus now, right? When I do that, I am perfecting his purpose. So, bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of salvation. He had to suffer to perfectly fulfill his purpose and who he is. He had to suffer so we wouldn't. He had to take the punishment for me. He had to die on the cross so I wouldn't die eternally. What did we just read in, uh, where is it? Verse 17 and 18. Verse 17 and 18. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, became like us in all things, so that he might become merciful and faithful high priest. What's the, what, what's the role of a high priest? To make sacrifices or atonement to God in the temple. That's the high priest's job. Make atonement for the sins of the people. He's the one who slaughters the lamb of sacrifice on behalf of all the people. So he had to make atonement as our high priest for our sins. Which is what he's saying when he says to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For he himself was tempted in which he had suffered. So he was tempted and he suffered as we were. So he... He is able to come to the aid of who? Those who were being tempted. He had to do this so that he can walk us through this. Amen. Okay? That's how he becomes perfected by his suffering. He's already perfect, but by choosing to suffer and become imperfect for us so that we can be perfected, it is perfecting him. It's kind of a, a reciprocal relationship that takes place. Hebrews 5, 5-9 says this, So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he said to him, You are my son. I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, You are a priest forever. This is God the Father talking to the Son according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered, this is Jesus in the flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications, intercessions, cries for us, with loud crying and tears, to who? To the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety or humility. He was crying out for us, and he was heard. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. So his suffering, what he went through, helped perfect who he is and his purpose and his calling to be on earth. We do that. Why do you think the Bible says every time somebody comes to Jesus, heaven rejoices? 
Because the work that Jesus did is being accomplished. Every time, and I know not all companies do this, but when somebody starts a company, they want their company to succeed. And in theory, they're trying to equip their staff with everything they need. And I say in theory, because I know everyone has views, with what they need to make the company better. And every time a division or a uh, part of a company succeeds, the company grows, the company benefits. Think of it that way. Every time one of us comes to Jesus, the kingdom grows, the kingdom rejoices, the kingdom celebrates. It makes it worthwhile. Jesus would have wasted his time if no one ever came to the Father and had communion again with the Father. But we did, and it's beautiful to see. So he tells him, he is the author of our salvation, and his authorship is made perfect through what he does, through bringing sons and daughters into glory, into his kingdom. So th then he goes on in verse 11, both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. So let's look at this for a second. Jesus sanctifies. What does that mean? To sanctify here, the definition is to make holy, to consecrate, to sanctify, to make sacred. I make holy, treat as holy, set apart as holy, hallowed, to purify. We always talk about how we need to position ourselves, which is the legitimate definition of consecrate. The Bible says you consecrate yourself. Position yourself so that God can sanctify you. So when my heart is humble before the Lord, and I'm in that position, He sends the fire. He sanctifies. He sets me apart. He makes me holy. I can't make myself holy. So Jesus sanctifies, and then we are sanctified because He sanctifies. For He for both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. So he does this. John 17, 17 says, sanctify them in the truth. And then he continues, your word is truth. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Jesus is the word of God. As the word of God, what he does, what he speaks, who he is, is truth. <clears throat> How do we get sanctified? In his truth, being obedient to his word. And, and exactly what was shared by Pat and my wife earlier. Positioning your heart to receive and stay true to the word of God. Proverbs 25, 4-5 says this. Take away the dross from the silver, and there comes a vessel for the smith. Take away the wicked before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Think about that. You t the dross are the impurities in the metal. The smith gets a pure metal when you, when you burn the dross off. You take away the wicked advisors from the king, the king's throne is blessed. Think about that. The king's throne is blessed. We're going through the book of Daniel. When the king listened to Daniel, he was blessed. When the king listened to the other advisors, there was no blessing. There was death and destruction. It's awesome. Isaiah 1.25 says, And also... I will also turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross. Get rid of the dross as with the lie and will remove all your alloy. Remove everything that's keeping you from me. So it is Jesus not only brings us to the Father by fulfilling his purpose, but then he sanctifies us so we can enter in through this blood, through what he did, through his fire. So then, he continues in verse 11, we, and Jesus had the same father. Listen to what he says, I love this. 
Listen to what he says about this. This is about the connectivity of our relationship with the Father and through the Son and the Son. Okay? This is how we're connected to the Father. He says, I will proclaim your name to my brethren. So what is Jesus doing to us? We are his brethren. You know, remember from day one we talked about we were called stewards of this creation, but Jesus was called to steward us, right? Steward us unto salvation. So I will proclaim your name to my brethren. Jesus declares the Father's name to us. So Jesus is a revealer of who the Father is. Right? To us. So his sons and daughters can actually know their Father. That's the, the thing. Imagine finding out you have a, a, a biological father and you're an adult and you've never met them. Well, how do you know your father? You need somebody to connect you to the father, to your father. You have to spend time with the father. Be drawn and all those things. Well, Jesus is the one who connects us to the father. He declares the name of the father to his brothers and sisters. Then, in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Who's singing the Father's praise? Jesus. What is he doing? Teaching us how to worship. Teaching us how to enter the presence of the Father. The Bible says uh, he is enthroned on the praises of his children, right? When we praise, he, he comes. When we revere him, he works. It, just like we talked about earlier, you know, we give the, the, the demons a right when we keep that door open, a legal right till we sh actually shut the door. In the same way, our praise opens the door for God to move. In the same way, in a more powerful way, when we praise, he is enthroned. In other words, he has rule and reign. So he's enthroned, we we'll recognize it. And he's doing this first. He's teaching us how to revere the Father, how to enter in. Then he says, I will put my trust in you. Jesus himself models putting trust in the Father for what? For us. As the Son, he chose to humble himself and not my will, but yours be done. So he's modeling, he is modeling a faith-filled relationship with the Father and what that looks like. So he's literally showing us as humanity, as his, Jesus' brothers and sisters in faith, as uh, uh, children of God, created of, by God's hand, how to have a relationship with the Father. He is our exact um, uh, Example for that. We imitate him. Why? Because he, he perfected what a relationship with the Father looks like. Even though he was fully man and fully, and fully God. He perfected. He, his humanity, his humanity humbled itself before his divinity. And then he said, Behold, I am the children whom God has given me. That's his stewardship, but he's indicating a unity. Those the Father surrounded Jesus with, together. There's a sense of unity here. There's a sense of purpose. It's perfecting the author of our salvation. That's his call to us. Come with me. Come on. Let me lead you to the Father. Let me lead you to the place where you actually belong. But then, verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. Jesus was like us. That through death, through his death, he might render what? Powerless. Him who had the power over death. That is the devil. And he might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. 
What is that referring to? Sometimes you can be so afraid of not doing something that you end up doing it. You know what? It's like you know you don't want to do this. And you try everything you can not to do it, but you somehow end up doing it. It's like that a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of thing. The Jews set up such a, a border around the word of God, around the law of Moses. You know, if, if the, the law said you can't walk more than, you know, 50 yards on the Sabbath, well, the Jews will say don't walk uh, 10 yards. That's just a, uh, you know, I'm giving you an example. That's not actually accurate. I'm just giving you an example of that. But they would put things to make sure you don't cross that line. And, it's, and sometimes when the boundary is so tight, you have no freedom. You have no room to choose. That, that those that might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. So they became a slave to their boundaries. There was no freedom in relationship. The father was this mean old dad that said, if you go one inch over those 50 yards, I'm going to punish you. That's not what God's about. Jesus came to show us that relationship. Ephesians 4.18 says this, Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led the captive, a host of captives, and gave gifts to men. When Jesus died, and Isaiah talks about Jesus went into hell and stole the keys of death. The thing that had the ability to keep us apart from the Father for eternity, when he was robbed of it. Jesus took it. Amen. And then, this is one of my favorite verses, just because of the power. When Jesus was glorified, it says, when he ascended on high, in Ephesians 4.18, he led captive a host. He led captive a host of captives. What did he do? He usurped. He usurped the authority of anyone that would try to keep us apart from God. He took captivity captive. He basically neutered them. Neutered the ability of the enemy to take our lives from us for eternity. Again, it's our choice in accepting Christ. We still have to have that relationship through Jesus. But he usurped the power that it, the enemy had over death. And, sin, and I love this. And he gave gifts to men. And then we go on about the different gifts he gives well, when you're free, I mean, when you're in captivity, I don't care how uh, talented you are, how gifted you are, how smart you are. I mean, Einstein, if he was trapped in an 8 by 8 cell for all his life, I don't care how brilliant that man is, he has no room to use his brilliance. I don't care what kind of anointing or gifting you have, if you're stuck in that prison, you're not going to be able to lose it, use it. But he's saying he's freed you and released the gifts he's given you. He's released them in you. He gave you gifts. And, he, and if you read, continue, it talks about the church. And who's the church? We are the church. So it's these gifts are meant to benefit one another, to continually keep us within the fold of family. Did you hear that? To, to keep us in the fold of family. Not churches, individual buildings, family. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians 4, 19-13 says this. Now, the expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. Just what I shared with you. 
he went down, he stole the, uh, usurped the power of death, and ascended up high. And then he talks about, gave some apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists, these are the gifts, and some as pastors, and some as uh, teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service and the building of the body through Christ. Ephesians 4, 7 says, but to each one of us, grace was given to the measure of Christ's gift. Think about that. So God looked at each one of us, and he says, I got, I'm gifting you with this. But when you're still in your in prison of sin, or prison of lack of relationship through me with the Father, your gift is useless. But I'm willing to release that gift to you if you would only choose to take the key that's already in your pocket and just unlock yourself and get out. He wants to give us those gifts. And I don't know, I'm, over the years, I've sat back, we've sat back and looked and seen. And when he says to the measure of their faith, you know what that means? That means as you choose to continue to grow, God's going to release more into you. I have more gifts today or things that God has given me than I did 10 years ago. I look around and I see some of you guys and as you, the more you submit to God, the more he will raise you up. The more you say yes to God, the more he will entrust you with. The more you rise up and fight through some of those things that hold you back, the more he would entrust you to fight through and the more he wants to give you. Not that the challenges become less, not that they become easier, but your strength will grow to overcome them so they will not feel like they're overcoming you. Yes, that's right. Because we're able to rise. Part of this is character. Submitting our character before God and letting him do that. Ephesians 4, 14, last verse. We're going to look at it. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and tossed there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Those gifts, those things that Jesus is releasing in our lives, in the victory he's given us, through what he went through, are meant to keep us on the straight path. With, Je with the Father, keeping us close to the Father's heart, that we don't stray from that. He wants us to get near to Him. As we began this uh, morning way, it is His desire to commune with us. That's what He wants. He's not waiting till our physical form dies and our spirit gets to heaven to commune with us. He wants to commune with us right now, today. And Jesus did everything he can to be the example, to show us how to imitate it, to imitate what we need to do. He was and is. He is stewarding us. He, he paid the cost for it. And he's still giving. Think about that. He not only gave at the cross and then gave and going to hell and doing his thing, but he's still giving. He is still pouring out. He is still giving. Why? To commune with you. To have a real relationship. In closing, I want you to just think about these, I guess there's six statements I'm going to make. And I'm calling these the dual roles of Jesus. The dual roles of Jesus. One, he's fully God and fully man. And he had to be that way. And the fully man submitting to the divine. Two, he was the high priest who sacrifices, who makes sacrifices 
but he was also the lamb of sacrifice. He was not only the one who does the sacrificing, he became the sacrifice. Three, was holy and blameless, but became sin for us. So he can take away our sin. He sat on his throne, but he chose to suffer and die. And now he sits on the throne. He owns everything, but became his own steward of, every, of us, of everything. To show us how to store it. He has all the gifts and anointings. And he's giving the gifts and the anointings. In a nutshell, in this four week series, this is what I saw. That Jesus not only set that example. But did everything he could. He was and he is. He did and he does. Everything we needed that we didn't have or weren't able to utilize, he took care of it. And as we walk with him, we are perfecting his purpose and unifying our hearts with him. I know this, this was pretty deep today and challenging and when it's up on video, I'm gonna have to please watch it again. It might help you understand a second time through because this is a very challenging thing. But the bottom line, it's about communion with God. Jesus doing what he can to restore the fellowship that sin set us apart from. Would you stand with me as we close? Thank you, Lord. Just close your eyes and bow you know, your heads and just get into that place with the Lord right now. We're listening to Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Papa. Thank you. I'm just going to rephrase in a prayer those things we just revealed. Thank you, Lord, that you are the one who sits on the throne, that you chose to come and die for our sins, be resurrected and be glorified. Thank you that in doing so, you, the one with all the gifts, have released the gifts to us in your spirit. Thank you that you were fully God and you were fully man to show us how to live in a way that honors you as human beings. Thank you that you are the one who made the sacrifices, but you became our sacrifice because there could be no other perfect sacrifice, Jesus. Thank you that you died to overcome death. Thank you that you were holy and blameless and became sin for us so we could live forever. Thank you that you own everything and you became steward of it all. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, we're asking right now that you just open our hearts to you. And if any of us here today don't know you as the one who saved them, as the one who just loves them, as the one who would do anything and everything for them and has, would you just open their hearts to you? In a moment, I'll lead you in a prayer, but just take a moment to just reflect with Jesus right now. Just listen to him. Listen to the tugging of his heart, of your heart. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If you've never accepted Christ, just simply say, Jesus. Thank you for what you did for me. Thank you for what you're still doing for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. 
and living a life that shows me how I can live with you. Thank you that my past is washed away by what you did on the cross. Thank you that I get to have a new life today in a relationship with you, Jesus, that brings me closer to the Father's heart. Thank you that you gave me your spirit along with all those gifts that's keep bringing me closer to you that I can use for your kingdom. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me the way you do. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that for the first time, just touch base with me afterwards. just want to take like two minutes to pray with you. Right there. All right, we got new chairs. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. We're gonna bless those chairs. So turn and put your hands on those chairs. And you guys are just gonna pray because you know this is a community building. Everybody in town comes here. Everybody in like the surrounding towns, they come here to serve the town. So go ahead, you guys open your mouth and bless those chairs. Whoever comes in, they're gonna feel the presence of the Lord. They're gonna feel the love of God. They're going to have changed hearts. I thank you that this is a place of community and they get to commune with the spirit of the living God because they have opened up their hearts to us. Amen? Amen. Amen. And now I want you to find a neighbor and bless them. We are the body of Christ, right? We are the priests. Mike is not the priest. We are the priests. We are all the priests. So find somebody. I want you to bless them. Bless them good. Lord, I thank you they would get money in the bank today. I thank you, Lord, they would have divine help this week. I thank you, Lord, any aches and pains would be gone. I thank you, Lord, they would have a new friend in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, they would feel lighter. <laughs> Bless them good. Healing. Blessings. Anointing. Surprises. Come on. Keep blessing them. Bless. We have the power to curse and we have the power to bless. Let's bless them. Bless your children. Yes. Bless your grandchildren. Now go with the Lord today. If you have your tithes and offerings, the box are in the back. And those of you watching online, if you'd like to support us, you can go to our website, bayshorebcf.com, and there's a giving prompt there. And have a blessed and wonderful weekend. Mm -hmm.